to done please come back yeah the recording okay, thank you very much for all the audience you still with us yeah this is uh, 59 yeah participants still with us now yeah yeah i think for the second session yeah we talk about the coarse and liquid feed yeah dr exactly. Rini. Yeah. yeah i think this uh, correlation with the chick performance but performance and also for the gut health yeah i think it is for a very important indicator yeah for the rearing for the for the chick yeah Okay, for the session, you still have uh, one hour or more or less, yeah, for presentation. Exactly. And the, the last time, maybe for the rest time, we st still have for the discussion, yeah. Yeah, I think from, I, from it, the student, yeah. It could be that uh, that I will go a little bit faster through okay. this presentation because we already discussed quite some aspects. Okay. Uh, and uh, but that, that doesn't matter, and then the questions will. Um, will appear so that's no problem at all yeah um, okay. what what i what i at least want to uh, emphasize is that okay. uh, in fact we are we are saying something or i will say something about nutritional concepts that you could use mm -hmm. on farm and uh, and in that way trying to help uh, both performance but also uh, gastrointestinal tract development and that is very um, important but let's see whether the my presentation goes yeah. further again yes here it goes further uh, some of this research we have done with broilers so i also will sometimes switch over to broilers i think even most of the data in this presentation are from uh, from broiler production and uh, where we are talking about is uh, on the one hand that uh, the the broiler is becoming heavier and heavier over the past uh, decades, um, but also observe more metabolic disorders. There is always one and a half percent of the chicks that is dying due to dehydration. Uh, and what we see nowadays is that uh, we want to use more and more uh, non-human animal feedstuffs for, uh, for our poultry. And that is also something that is challenging at least the broiler production in, um, in the Netherlands and, uh, and the surrounding uh, countries. And this is also a very nice graph from Ponton a couple of years ago that there's always a relationship between the diet of the host, the immune system of the host and the microbial community in the gut, uh, which is basically a symbiosis between the, the host and the, and the microbes. Uh, and that, that means that there is a certain a nutritional status. And we need to be aware that that's all happening quite early already in, uh, in the young, in, in young lives, so to say. I, I, I used to call it, it's all interrelated and it makes it also quite difficult to, uh, to understand and, and also to uh, uh, not only to understand, but, uh, but to comprehend, to, to, to know exactly on which, where you could turn a little bit in order to get it in the right direction. So, well, if we're talking about boosting broilers early development, then our hypothesis was to feed young broilers a moist, and you can, you can call it different ways. You could say it is a moist diet, you could say liquid diet, or a wet diet, and I'm using those terminology one after each other, but I always mean with that, that it is a diet with about 50% dry matter as such. And we would like to use these type of diets to predisposition, so to, to get the gastrointestinal tract ready to get a better nutrient utilization and enhanced performance and basically as well also a, a better immune competence. The latter one is not really always very, very visible, but an enhanced performance is definitely what we uh, saw. Well, and here I'm coming back to uh, what, what I was telling in the beginning. And therefore I, I said, this might go a little bit quicker than, uh, than the first presentation, because here you see again, the two definitions about how important it is to, uh, to uh, to be ensure that a young bird or a young human being 
is fed with uh, adequate nutrients, very, very important, because this was what uh, uh, a lady from uh, one of our groups, uh, the adaptation physiology group, she did a PhD in, and finished that in 2015. And she said the, the first week of life is dramatically important for, uh, for a young chick as, as such. And why is that so important? And I'll show it over here. Because there is always a time lag between hatch and the first meal on the farm. And the little hatch, hatched chick is coming in a total new environment. Uh, uh, might de might uh, depend a little bit on the yolk sac for the first nutrients. But we all know that the yolk sac is decreasing quicker if feed intake is enhanced. So external feed intake is enhanced, then the yolk sac will diminish quite quickly. But still, the birds have to search their nipples, the nipples to, for, the, for the water intake, and to have the, to search the feed. And what you see in many, many cases is that still some of the birds staff form dehydration. And that is about one and a half percent, both in, uh, in, in layer chickens as in, uh, in brother chickens. And Mr. Forbes, Mike Forbes from the UK, from Nottingham University, he did a very nice study with uh, some PhD students in the late 90s. And he was feeding a so-called, uh, I call it a porridge, a kind of a wet diet, mixed feed and water, one to one and in fact what he was doing is just helping the bird to moisturize the diet in the crop and therefore the crop could be for example limiting a limiting factor and if you observe birds very very uh, well then you will you will see that many many chickens in the barn will constantly they, they eat first and then they go directly to the to the bell drinker or to the nipple in order to moisturize the diet in the crop so in fact what you are doing if you are feeding a porridge you avoid that there is a time lag between moisturizing the dry diet in the crop so, so that could mean that there is a higher and uh, we are actually doing such an or we did we did such an experiment to see whether the mean retention time in the crop and then gives it would be a little bit quicker if you would feed uh, a wet diet. So there is a lady uh, currently, she already did all her experiments to, uh, to with an early feed intake of a coarse porridge and that may potentially boost gastrointestinal tract and immune development. And actually the latter one, immune development was not well, that was not a real direct result from, uh, from this study, but we, we tried to, to see something in boosting the gastrointestinal tract. And I, I won't show you the, 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 the little video that, that is underneath here, but the funny thing is that uh, this PSE student has a parrot at home. And what she normally sees is that if the parrot gets a cracker, which is totally dry, then the cracker is first soaked in water before the parrot is eating it. So that means that those birds cannot cope easily with a totally dry diet. And this, is, this was a very nice example of, uh, of uh, a soaking element in, uh, in a dry diet, so to say. And this is another quite nice experiment that we did. Also, a couple of years ago, we fed birds in one pen. We had, we had several pens, but within one pen, we gave birds access to a feed trough with a dry diet and a feed trough with a wet diet. And what you can see here in seven days, from one to seven days of age, the dry feed intake per chicken from the wet diet and from the dry diet. And what you see here is that almost 90% of the birds prefer by far the wet diet. 
and their their dry feed intake is much higher from uh, from uh, from the wet diet. So this was already something that we thought, okay, the bird in this preference test, they prefer the the wet diet. And and here's here you can see what is happening then with body weight and, and average daily gain. Body weight was about 10% higher on the dry diet, of on the, sorry, on the wet diet. And that's 75 grams after seven days or 192 grams after seven days. If you relate it to a single dry diet. And this is also quite a nice one. What we did after seven days of age, we fed the broilers whole or ground wheat in their diet. So we, we incorporated, there was, of course, we incorporated already wheat, but we, at a certain moment, we used on the one hand ground wheat and on the other hand, whole wheat in the diet. And what you see here is that the birds hardly prefer the dry diet anymore. Those are the red lines. They don't eat that. They only eat the, uh, the wet diet. Those are the blue lines. But what was quite nice to see that they prefer the wet diet where the whole wheat was included. So the bird also needs not only a more forage type of diet, but the bird also prefers that with larger particles in it, because whole wheat is far larger, of course, than, than ground wheat. So they don't like a totally fine diet. That's exactly, and that is, we should remember that whenever we are feeding uh, a pellet, the pellet is dissolved in the crop. And what you are feeding then is basically uh, a diet which is like with ground wheat, which has a, a, a lot of small particles with no structure in it anymore. And in fact, if the bird has the choice, they don't prefer that. They prefer more coarser particles in a wet environment. And the crop is of course a very wet environment as such. So this was, this was also quite a nice one that we, that we saw. And here you see again, it's about it's a little bit more than 10% than difference in body weight at 21 days of age between the single dry diet and, uh, and, and the choice where uh, with this uh, wet diet. And you could take this, this whole wet, the whole wheat wet diet into account. Well, we did several experiments in this, in this way, and I'll show you just uh, one now. What we did here in this experiment is that we had four treatment groups. One was a dry diet, four was a wet diet. So it was the one-to-one -one dilution of water in a dry diet. And two and three were that we changed over. So after feeding a wet diet, from zero to seven days of age, or from zero to 21 days of age, we changed over back to a dry diet in order to, to investigate whether it would be enough to only feed a wet diet in the beginning of the, 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 grower, the grower phase. So please check very carefully what is happening with this T2 when we only have a wet diet in the first week of their life, of their, of their for example, five or, or six weeks uh, of age life. In this, in this situation, it was um, uh, five weeks uh, that we were having those birds. Well, we have, no, this is an, this is a, you have to check at a certain moment, the papers that are coming out, but we did a lot of different, uh, 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 observations like behavioral observations, dissections on the on histology, uh, nutrient digestibility, microbiology, from the CICA, and a lot of uh, performance parameters. And as you can see, that the second point 
below feed intake, you see evaporation because what you need to take into account in order to know exactly how much dry feed the birds has been eaten is that you take evaporation in the barn into account because that is happening, of course, from your wet diet, so to say. Well, here are a couple of uh, data. And you see here that uh, feed conversion ratio, and <coughs> uh, see, I again see here that the, that the, the y-axis is, uh, is not the correct one. So uh, that happened at a certain moment and I do not know exactly why. So don't, don't bother a little bit to, uh, don't, don't worry too much about that, but the, the bars are, uh, are, are still okay. Uh, and, and I'm sorry that I did not see that uh, on forehand. I've seen it once and then we changed it, but I, I didn't see it this afternoon when I was opening the, the, <coughs> the slide uh, or the, the, the presentation. But what you see here from day zero to day seven, there was only a dry feed and all the other treatment groups were just wet because there was no change in those treatment T2, T3, and T4. It was all being fed a wet diet. And here you see that the feed conversion ratio uh, was quite lower than in the dry fat birds. Again here, feed conversion ratio always based on dry feed intake. If you see it from zero to 22 weeks of age, and then we have some differences there, then you see that the dry feed has the highest feed conversion ratio, so the most worse feed, conver feed conversion ratio. And whenever you go to a more dry diet, up to 22 weeks, uh, 22 days of age, then you see that feed conversion ratio is going down. And the same is what you see after 35 days of age, then you see that there is some in the intermediate between the two, um, T2 and T3 treatment group. So they were halfway changed over from a wet diet to a dry diet. And you see that the lowest feed conversion ratio was reached if you feed the birds all the time a wet diet. That's actually what is uh, happening in this, um, in this presentation or in, in, in this slide. What is another important aspect is that we checked variation in feed intake and body weight gain. And what you see is that the variation over 35 days of age, and these are all pens, all the dots and the squares, the triangles are different pens in one study. And you see that whenever you have uh, T1, which is uh, a dry diet, that you see that the variation in feed intake and the variation in body weight gain is far larger than when you are feeding a wet diet, a totally wet diet. Then the variation of the birds, you could say the uniformity of the birds is better than on the dry diet. And that always has to do with, uh, for example, the moisture capacity, passage rate probably, and while you are talking about passage rate, you, you always have to take into account also absorption and digestibility in that way. So you see, it also helps to have a more uniform uh, flock. These were some little data. We, we can, you can show that a little bit uh, on, on another moment, a little bit better, but you see that the eating duration per meal is a little bit higher on, uh, on the moist, on the wet diet. Also, the eating duration per hour is also a little bit higher. And we, we know by now that it's always quite nice if you have a longer eating time, because normally birds would scavenging around 80% of their daytime. And in a, in a barn, in commercial enterprises, it's only about uh, 10 to 15% of their daytime budget that they are uh, eating. So whenever you can increase that, so that the birds be, are becoming not uh, showing some misbehavior, then that would be a, a good one. And now I have to have to see what is behind. Is the meal frequency is also a little bit uh, 
higher for the uh, for the moist diet, as you can see there. And in terms of histology, the, we are most of the time checking a feeding length of um, in the, in the duodenum, sometimes as well in the ileum, but the duodenum is the most contrast uh, contrasting one. And here you can see that uh, the feeding length is uh, higher in the the blue the blue uh, boxes, as you can see. Uh, and that means that uh, particularly if you're talking about uh, the first eight days, villi length or villi are developing quicker in the moist diet than in the dry diet. You see that later on, it flattens out. There is not a large difference anymore to, towards the end. But in the beginning, you see that the, the, the development of the gastrointestinal tract in terms of villi length is better for a uh, for birds that are being fat and moist diet, so to say. So that means that whenever we are talking about um, mesh versus pellets, then please use mesh if you want to make a wet diet. That's far better than using pellets, so to say, so you don't have to pelletize it first. Feed conversion ratios are better. Uh, uniformity is most of the time better. They have in one week time larger feli, and they show an increased eating behavior, but, but there's something else. You should not feed a very fine porridge because birds need a coarse diet. And we saw that, we saw that already in one of the slides when I uh, showed uh, uh, the whole wheat in those, uh, in those uh, feed troughs and the birds were very eager on, on, that, uh, on that whole wheat wet diets. Why is that so important? Because we do not need to neglect functional properties of the gastrointestinal tra tract. And one researcher from the, from the UK once said the gastrointestinal tract has adapted to its natural resources over millions of years. And that means that we are talking in birds about refluxing and there are three sites of refluxing and I'll show you in a minute where those three sites are. Gizzard is the pacemaker. I, I told that already in the first presentation. Pellets normally dissolve totally in the crop. So although we might think that the pellet is a hard particle, it's not a hard particle because from the crop level onwards up to the gizzard, it is, a, it is a fine, it is a very fine uh, forage if you're feeding uh, a pellet. Uh, so, and that means that particle sizes uh, uh, really are, are very important in, in poultry nutrition as such. This is something on my slide, I do not know what. Um, and basically that particle size is a very important aspect, has been done by work of two Norwegian researchers, Birgis Fius, and Harald Hedland uh, during the first uh, 15 years of, uh, of this uh, century. And I'll show you this one because this is in my perception and I always had a big discussion with my former uh, professor in ruminant nutrition, Sir Tomiga. He found the, the, that cattle has the most magnificent gastrointestinal tract, but I think that birds have a very interesting gastrointestinal tract. Why? Because there are three sites of refluxing. The first one is the proventricularis and the gizzard. It is a kind, it's, it's a little bit like the, the reticulum and the rumen. The, the particles are being pushed from the proventriculus to the gizzard, back, back and forward, after they have left the crop, so to say. And in fact, if it would be in one direction, it would be quite strange that you first have the proventriculus and then the gizzard. From a chemical perspective, it would be more logic, from a nature perspective, it would be more not logic to have first the teeth, the gizzard, to grind, and then all the acids and the enzymes from the proventriculus. However, in the bird, it's the other way around. 
Is that a problem? No, it's not a problem because material is constantly pushed back from the geyser to the perventriculus back and forward. So that's the first spot of reflexing. So therefore you can, all, you can also imagine that if you have a very weak gizzard because of a very fine particle uh, size, then there is no contraction activity by the gizzard and no contraction activity by the proventriculus. So it means that you need to have a strong gizzard proventriculus. I'll show you potentially probably also in this, this presentation what can happen if the isthmus, which is the, the, the relative um, uh, part between the proventriculus and the gizzard, which is called the isthmus, if that one is, is widened, then you have a hypertrophy of that area. And then there is now no reflux at all anymore. In order to increase absorption, also there is an intestinal reflux for contractions per hour in the small intestine. And the third reflux is occurring in the colon where, and there, there we can see that the bird is much more resembling uh, a cow, a ruminant than, uh, than a pig. So it's, by, by the way, it's never a monogastric animal. Huh? We, we have already a proventrugus and a gizzer. So never tell me that birds are monogastric. No, they are already polygastric, polygastric. They're not ruminating, but they are polygastric. They have two, two stomachs, so to say. However, where does the bird so resemble a cow? And that's because non-utilized nitrogen can be transferred from the cloaca via the colon back into the cecum. And that, is, that has to do with the fact that if the bird is eating quite a low nitrogen level, then the bacteria in the cecum, in, in the cecum could not survive. And that's the reason that undigested, or no, non-utilized nitrogen can flow back in the cloaca and get back into, the, into those bacterial containers, the cecum. Uh, and that's the reason that the Sika are in this way anatomically oriented uh, on, on, at, and attached to the gastrointestinal tract. So they are most of the time uh, intervened by the, the colonic antiperistaltic uh, movements. They are filled in, in, that, uh, in that way. And this is this system where the bird is using non-utilized nitrogen is exactly the same mechanism as uh, well, what we call in rumens, the rumen hepatic cycle, where you also get more non-utilized nitrogen back into the rumen, so to say. Well, to give you an idea what is actually happening, if you have um, uh, a, a coarse pellet, so to say, oh, no, sorry, uh, a coarse diet, which is uh, whole wheat, for example, if you include whole wheat in your diet, of you are feeding uh, finely ground wheat in the pellet. And what you see in terms of aging, and Ricarda Engberg from Denmark, she did a very nice little study about this. And she showed that in the beginning, when the birds are 14 days of age, the, uh, the, the pH in the gizzard is quite low. Great. But whenever you are going down, you see that on the whole wheat diet, the gizzard pH remains low where for the pellet is going upper and upper and upper. That means that there is not a pH barrier anymore between the gizzard on the one hand and the, the, the small intestine and the duodenum on the other hand, because you slowly see that whenever the birds are becoming older, that, uh, that there are no pH barriers anymore and the, and the pH is becoming larger and larger in the, in the gizzard, more resembling towards the pH of the the, the the small intestine. Here you see it. Uh, to give another quite nice example is that we once, uh, this is also a, the study of uh, Kwasrani, we once uh, made diets where we literally substituted rapeseed meal by soybean meal. You could also say the other way around. 
we, subsid we gradually substituted soybean meal by rapeseed meal. Because that means that when you have rapeseed meal in 0%, you had a whole soybean meal diet. And now I have to, to get the, our own pictures a little bit gone because then I can see it directly. And what you see here, that if you go from a good diet to a more bad diet, you see that that villi length or villi height is going down. If you go from a good diet to a bad diet, you see that it is going down, villi height. And you see that crib depth in that way is going up. If you have a fine diet. The good thing is that the decline on a more coarse diet is not so steep going down as on the fine diet. So you prevent a little bit the negative effects of a rapeseed meal diet by feeding the diet in coarse form. And you see that particularly very well in the crib depth because the crib depth on the on the course diet remain more or less uh, similar. You see a little bit of variation over there, but you see that the grip depth is increasing quite dramatically when you go from a good diet to a bad diet. This is a very, very nice example of how the structure of the diet is directly interfering with whether you have a, a good source of protein or, or a bad source of, uh, of protein. The, the histological um, uh, analysis is what is always in our uh, in our repertoire if we are looking to uh, to gut health in that situation. Oh, this is the one. Oh, yeah. Here you see, these are these are some preliminary uh, results. What we did here is in T uh, two and T three, as you can see. Here is that we were using twenty percent brewers spent grain, so that's the beer byproduct, or we were using 20% wheat yeast concentrate. And we compare that with a commercial dry pellet and a commercial wet mesh, so to say, with a couple of broilers. And what you see here is that the brewer spent grain was by far the best one in performing, better than the wheat yeast concentrate uh, and, and definitely better than the commercial dry uh, dry pellet as you can see it uh, from here. Well, we are doing a lot of uh, these type of, uh, of experiments as you can see uh, here. These are quite uh, uh, preliminary, so to say, uh, but we see that the VD length is, uh, is changing here again. You have a higher one in, in, in this way. Uh, but here also the, the the dry diet is is doing it uh, in, in, in quite a try, quite a good day kind of, quite a good way. So for up till the end, some take home messages. Whenever you want to stimulate early feed intake and maintain the gut pH barriers, then you should feed a wet and coarse diet. So incorporate structure in your feed formulation. I think that is not happening all the time. And it, we, we used many, many times exactly the same ingredients, uh, ingredients in our diets, also in, in terms of percentages. And it made quite a difference whether we were grinding the diet, made a pellet out of it, or we were feeding it at the mesh using a roller mill, it was a dr dramatic difference in performance uh, of the birds. So it, it, structure is, is really a big, uh, big component. And, and another thing is that whenever you would like to use uh, lower digestible ingredients, then please uh, be aware that if you use those lower digestible ingredients, that you take the reflux into account, it means that you are using more structural uh, diets, particularly lower digestible ingredients will come forward whenever we uh, do not want to, to get into the, the feed food uh, competition. And that would mean that whenever we are using those type of feedstuffs coming from the food industry that are by definition, most of the time, lower digestible, 
then we should make an optimal use of the gastrointestinal tract characteristics of birds. And I think, but I'm not sure that this might be, yeah, this might be the last slide for now. Pooh, there was a lot here, Van. I'm quite, uh, I'm becoming a little bit tired <laughs> from, from the, the two presentations. Yes, 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 okay. Thank you very much for Dr. Rene, yeah, for the interesting presentation, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll stop the sharing because then I yeah. see many of you. Yeah, okay. Which is nicer. Okay, you have a presentation for 40 minutes. Yeah, I think you still have a question, maybe a little yeah. bit slowly, yeah, because you're yeah. getting tired now. <laughs> okay, please, the audience, if you have a question, you can speak up uh, directly to Dr. Rene. Yeah, she want to hear from you. Yeah, the question. Most of please. the students. You, yes, you are, student, you are all please. in the beginning of the day. I'm yeah. at the end of the day now. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. You yeah. should <laughs> uh, be very uh, lively. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 30 minutes, please. Yeah. After yeah. you take a rest. Okay. So go ahead. Please, if you have a question, student. We have a question from uh, Dimas Wiryawan, Dr. Ivan. Okay. Prof. Rene. Yeah. It seems uh, that he has a uh, trouble with uh, his uh, microphone. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, he wrote in the chat room. Wait a minute. He, I'll check. The, I think about I'll the heat the stress. Chat. Yeah. The heat stress can cause a damage to inter intestinal organ stress because of yeah. the temperature. Or will the function of internal be not optimal? Can heat stress? cause damage to internal organs such as liver damage or will the function of internal organs be not optimal? I think the latter one, but I'm not really an expert in, um, in all the different effects of, uh, of heat stress. What you normally see in, uh, in heat stress conditions is that the bird prevents by itself uh, damage to the, uh, to the internal metabolism by not eating a lot. And, uh, but that's not nice because whenever they are not eating anymore, then they won't grow anymore. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not really into um, turn, uh, turn Veldkamp, uh, one of my former PZ students, he did a study with turkeys. But also Shavan from Jambi University, he also had, uh, of course, some, some heat stress uh, studies. So stress. Check. Check, for example, also his thesis, whether you might find uh, some, some clues in that way. And then yeah. there is a second question. Does the difference in the form of the feet affect the evaporation process that occurs in the broiler body? But I meant with evaporation process Indeed. not in the body of the bird, but in the barn. Mm. So I mean, yeah. the evaporation was particularly meant for um, uh, to calculate the amount of dry diet that the birds had been okay. eating. Yeah, not, not in the chicken not body. Not in the body. No, not in the body. Yeah, yeah get your Dimas, yeah. Okay. Next question, please, if you... Yeah. I also see a lot of ladies here, but Dimas is uh, eager in, in asking questions. That's nice. Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah, you can. Oh, okay, but you did. You asked this question already, I see. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Dr. Rene, about the, yeah. the what is dry matter content, yeah? You say for the wet uh, field, is about 50 uh, percent yeah 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 if you change yeah the the dry matter for example in the last uh, time of the way it is uh, the um, starter yeah. period yeah have you decreasing 
in the gradually or you can change automatically to the for example from 50 to 25 for example the dry matter content the, no the, the, the water this content is, sorry. this is a very good question Irfan, because the um the dry matter content of your diet mm -hmm. is is the most important part if you are doing uh, liquid or wet feeding and why is that because it is fully dependent on the on the ingredient composition whether you should have for example one to one or one to 1.2 or one to 1.3 and that has to do yeah. with the fact that some of the ingredients have a high water binding capacity and that yeah. means that they are drying quickly out mm -hmm. and, and particularly if you have young chickens and you have yeah. 32 degrees in the barn or 30 yeah. or whatever 28 then then you 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 might get a thick layer on top mm -hmm. of the feed mm -hmm. okay. and whenever the layer is too high too thick then the birds will not pick through it anymore so you really have to to investigate very carefully what is the optimum balance between your dry uh, feed and your and the water that you are mm -hmm. um, supplying at the same mm -hmm. time. That's a very important aspect. Yeah, um, yeah. Because I think the the wet feed is more voluminous, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. Yeah. Of course, it will. It it's becoming, but that's no problem. That's the same volume as what you will get when the okay. bird is eating and drinking. Uh, in a consecutive way. Yeah, because I just think running... with the with the crop capacity will be more easier to uh, to full because of the voluminous of the wet feed. Yeah. Well, in fact, it means that what the bird actually is doing by eating a wet diet uh, okay. is that she is avoiding, or or if it is a male bird, he is avoiding to uh, to to do it by themselves and, and to say, okay, mm -hmm. first I'm eating and then I'm trying to moisturize him. It's the, good, the good thing is that, uh, yeah, what I, what I, I compare with most of the time that uh, the crop is the mixing of the crop is because the yeah. bird is constantly going down, yeah. going yeah. up, going down, going up. Because yeah. she's eating and then she's going up. So the mixing, is constantly by the head is going up and down, up and down, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and that makes the mixing. But that will take time, yeah, the mixing. And if you already feed the porridge, then the bird has that advantage that she doesn't need the time. And potentially, the that's that's based on the fact that we see that a higher feed intake will give a higher uh, body weight development. Or body weight, uh, body weight growth, so to say, uh, body growth, daily growth, and that has to do with the fact that potentially the transit time is a little bit quicker from the from the crop going down yeah. to the proventriculus and the gizzard. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I see. I see in front of me here uh, a young lady. And she is called Poppy Satya. Poppy. And she probably, will, I, I can hardly imagine that she doesn't have a, a question for me. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe uh, I have questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, to be honest, I have a layer forming in my house. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, for, was it, for the first week, uh, we separate the the bird which which has not achieved the body weight standard yeah. and then we uh give a wet a feed to them yeah and and after that maybe uh at the 12 uh sorry just for information in indonesia maybe from the first until 10 or 12 weeks uh, the bird live in the hostel cage yeah. And then and then move to battery cage uh -huh. uh, on on twelve weeks. Twelve yeah. weeks, yes. 
And then uh, when the birds have moved to battery cage, uh, the body weight uh, was that going down. Yeah. So they lost they lost body weight. And is it possible if we give the web feet to achieve the body weight standard? Is it okay? Uh, about is it still possible they can achieve the body weight standard again? If you would feed them a wet diet, that's what you mean, right? Yeah. Yes. Well, the best way is to uh, to do that experiment yourself. So uh, practically in my farm, they yeah. just pour the water into the dry feed because, yeah. because the bird cannot, what is it? The feed intake cannot achieve the standard. So maybe it causes the loss weight. And and so, and then and, and you 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 use already a kind of a, a wet feeding method in order to to get that bird back on their on their growth curve, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And it works. That's what that's what you observed already. Uh, it works, but it's it's very slow back to the uh what's that standard body weight okay and is that, it, is that, it yeah go ahead uh, so yeah. uh is it poppy is already applied the, the yeah. wet feed yeah uh -uh. but the 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 effect is uh he he have a lower performance compared with the standard yeah. it's very slow to get back to the uh, body weight standard yeah yeah. So you, so what you think is that they might not be accustomed to the wet diet, and they are eating less of their diet. Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so they have a yeah. bit less performance. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, or maybe the birds is stressed because they move to the battery cage or yeah, yeah, yeah. any other possibility. Yeah, that can, that's also possible. You see, you you should really try to 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 see and to research what type of interventions are actually happening and what is the bird doing and how is the bird reacting um, and how do i present the the feed is is she changing from one environment to another environment all of these aspects could play a role in uh, in, in what she is doing actually in terms of um, feed intake and, and i still belief in the the proposition of the beginning of the evening that they say whenever you get them on the on the diet and they eat enough they will gain definitely okay okay so uh is it still okay if if i continue to keep uh, water to the feed as long as uh, at least the feed intake standard achieve it is it okay is it still okay yeah, of course. Of okay, course, you can okay. do that. Okay, and basically, okay. the outcome is what your performance is doing. Eh? That is the most important part, of course. So you should, you should keep the, the bird in, in weighing, etc. Uh -uh. Compare it to the rest of the group. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Thank Great. you. You're welcome. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, that is all I think, Dr. Rene. Yeah. There's no, no more question from the audience? Yeah. I think so. Yeah, okay. It's very interesting information from you. It's already uh, shared with the, my student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and because I think in Canada it's already yeah, 10 p.m. Eh? Yeah, it's the yeah, almost night. Yeah, so I think it's time for to, for your, your rest. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, okay. but and, and and what I what I mentioned is uh, in the beginning is very important that whenever there are students that would like to have either more information on, okay. on poultry nutrition or more information about studying in Wageningen, okay. they are most welcome to. Um, to ask me, so don't don't worry about that. And we have yeah, okay. we have a very next to the Chinese community of students. I think the second 
largest student community in Wageningen is the okay. Indonesian students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay. there are a lot. Uh, are, how about the postdoctoral uh, program, Prof. Rini? Post what do you mean with, with postdoctoral? Uh, I don't know, maybe a program for uh, uh, we read, we uh, write something, maybe a program we can write a, a journal together. Yeah, join well, communication there, maybe. Yeah, there, that there are, but what the, the point is always that um, even for postdoc positions, the the ones that uh, we get in Wageningen, they they should have also a kind of a, a scholarship because that that most of the time you need money prior to uh, to entering mm -hmm. the the university, and uh, that is a little bit uh, a tricky thing. Uh, yeah. but there, there, there might be possibilities, of course. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a good opportunity for us, yeah, for yeah. students, for the young lecture, or for the exactly. doctoral program. Yeah, maybe Dr. Rene will guide us, will help us, yeah, to give uh, some maybe need a recommendation letter. Yeah, maybe one of you, if you need the doctor Rene email, yeah, you can contact uh, me directly yeah. and i will yeah perfect okay for the end I, in be, on behalf of the faculty dr rene i will say thank you very much yeah for your time for your knowledge yeah you already share yeah very valuable uh, information and also the knowledge yeah okay. thank you very much yeah maybe i hope it's not only this uh finish of the this program i hope no. uh, they will be continued the this cooperation yeah Maybe Definitely. for the yeah, I can invite you come to Indonesia, please. Yeah, maybe we, I have a chance to go to the Netherlands. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Okay. Hopefully. <laughs> well. Okay. Hopefully. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. I was. Yeah. It was very nice to have you, um, all of you there in uh, Indonesia, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and uh, and I like to uh, to give this uh, presentation. So we definitely keep into contact. And uh, yeah. we'll see you another uh, another moment. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank okay, you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, terima kasih buat semuanya. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.